But it really was a quite a spring. Lynn and I had gotten through the first legislative session. We had cut all the budget cuts, made all the budget cuts. And so we were planning to go to California. Uh, a friend had invited us to come out. And then I said to Linda, you know, the Big Sioux River looks like it might flood. And I, can't, I really shouldn't be away from South Dakota if that occurs. So we canceled our trip. And I remember going to Sioux Falls and Brookings and Watertown, warning people that the Sioux River might flood. Well, as it turned out, the thaw was a little bit more moderate and slower. And the water came up a little bit, but no flooding. So I thought, well, we dodged the flood bullet in 2011. Little did I know that uh, that was uh, not going to be the case. When I learned about the Missouri River flood, it was uh, the last week of May. It was the week before Memorial Day weekend. And some members of the staff, the Secretary of Agriculture, some, the mayor of Brookings, some other folks, were with me. We were flying back from Chicago. We had gone to Chicago to recruit Bell Brands. They make the cheese, uh, snack cheese, and we were in the running. They were looking at four different states, and we wanted them to choose South Dakota to bring their cheese plant. So we pitched the board of directors at their headquarters in Chicago, and we were coming back from that, and then we found out about this phone call that the Army Corps of Engineers had held to inform everybody that uh, the releases from the system of dams uh, was uh, going to be at record levels. And just to give your viewers a sense, in Pier, the record level set in 1997 was 59,000 cubic feet per second. It had never been higher than that. In 50 years of the dam system, Remember, President Kennedy was the president when that dam was uh, completed. And so in that 50 years following then, the highest it had ever come out was 59,000 cubic feet per second. And they said, it looks like it might be 85,000. So, boy, our antenna went up. We were very worried. We alerted people in Pier and Fort Pier and downstream that they better get ready because the water would come up. Little did we know that in the several days following that the Army Corps of Engineers would raise their estimation of what the flows would be. Not 85, no, it was going to be more like 100 or 110,000 cubic feet per second, almost double the previous record. In the end, they estimated uh, about four days after their first estimation, it would go as high as uh, 150,000 cubic feet per second. And in fact, that still wasn't as high as it actually got. It actually got to 160,000 cubic feet per second at one point in time. So it was uh, significantly more water than we've ever experienced downstream of the dams since the dams were constructed. When we look at, uh, for me, the, the whole event begins on Tuesday, May 24th. It seemed like the world exploded. I have no better way to describe it than that. Everything about the summer, everything blew up from that moment in time. What, what was your perspective of how things went from there? Yeah, well, as a new governor, I was still learning the ropes about being a governor. And uh, one of the things I remember being counseled by the National Governors Association right after the election, before I was even sworn in, they said, get ready for disasters because you never know when they're going to happen. They could happen very early in your, your administration. So develop relationships with FEMA because those relationships you may need to call upon. And so we did. We called upon FEMA. We. Um, the most important thing, of course, was to alert South Dakotans. And so we had, day after day, we began to have press conferences to let South Dakotans know, especially in those river communities, how high the water would rise. And, and uh, all we could do was pass along the information we were provided. Those uh, flow rates 
those thousands of cubic feet per second, we had to translate them into elevations. So people could say, well, my house is at this elevation and the water is predicted to rise to that elevation. Is my house threatened or not? And that was difficult to do because we don't have very good science in that area sometimes. And also, we, at the same time, we wanted to scramble to build levees in Pier and Fort Pier and downstream of Yankton in, in housing developments leading to Dakota Dunes and including develop, uh, Dakota Dunes. We knew if we acted quickly, we might have the uh, ability to build levees that would protect homes from overland flooding that would otherwise tear them off their foundations and ruin them. So we started scrambling to let contracts and the Army Corps had to be involved in that. And, um, but they were, they were very good about their uh, understanding what needed to be done. The challenge was to encourage South Dakotans to protect themselves because I had to be frank, we don't know if we're gonna get these levees up in time we don't know if they'll hold if we do get them up in time. So to be safe, you should assume that we won't get them up or they won't hold and you should protect yourself. So be self-reliant. And so uh, our citizens up and down the river scrambled to sandbag their homes. The National Guard was activated. Um, we activated uh, many groups of uh, prison inmates to help, and then the volunteers just came from everywhere. How important was it that we have every person possible in uh, responding to this? Uh, very important. Uh, in both cases, we had contractors who really took great risks to respond to our need for levies. In Pier and Fort Pier, uh, Milt uh, Morris, uh, came forward and and bid on the uh, levy contract. He was the only contractor to bid, and I just thank goodness that he was located in Pier Fort Pier area, so that he had equipment. But even then, the equipment that was available to his firm was not enough, and so he had to recruit bulldozer operators and bulldozer equipment pieces of equipment. We issued calls for trucks. We issued calls for bulldozers. We identified the kind of bulldozers that uh, Milt needed. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, we had people coming from other states to help run this equipment. We had farmers come and, and run trucks because they knew how to drive a truck, even though they didn't do so commercially. And uh, all those things coming together made it possible to get these levees up in time. In fact, not only was the levee in, Port, in Pier and Fort Pier built in time, but there was still adequate time to build more levee than we thought was possible. So some levees were extended up into uh, the Fort Pier uh, upstream areas that we did not expect initially to uh, be able to handle. Uh, Marion's Garden, for example, we didn't expect to be able to get a levee up and cross the inlet to Marion's Garden. But all that happened because South Dakotans and Milt Morris in particular had the courage to say, I'm going to try. And uh, not only did he succeed, but he did more than was expected. The same was true in the Dakota Dunes area. We had uh, Rick Wager and his uh, partner, uh, I forget his first name, Mr. Brown. Uh, they had never built a levee before, but they took the plunge. They actually started building the levee down there before we had a contract. And uh, we backed into a contract. The Army Corps of Engineers would not agree to let a contract for some parts of the, of the uh, dunes that were close to the river. They wanted to build a levee that was back and that left, oh gosh, maybe a hundred or more than a hundred houses exposed, saying we can't get the levee next to the river built. We're going to build one back here. But we said, no, we're going to build this levee down by the river. We're going to protect the whole Dakota Dunes area. 
And so we actually built two levees, one levee next to the river to protect all the homes and a fallback levee a little bit away from the river that the Army Corps had more confidence could be built in time. We got them both built in time. And uh, again, I give credit to uh, Wager and Brown for having the courage to agree that they do this. They contacted uh, with uh, earth movers around the Sioux Empire area in the Sioux City area who are competitors to one another. We needed them all to come together and work together. And then um, we had um, Jim Soka come down from Sioux Falls and act in a way as the coordinating uh, earth moving contractor and helped kind of lead this consortium of all these earth moving contractors to build this levee. We closed one lane of Interstate 29 and made it a haul road. He said, the, the, because there was an area where we were borrowing fill, they call it borrowing fill. They, I don't know, they never return it. They're just taking fill. They're getting the clay from one area that was several miles away from the placement area. And we knew that if the trucks had to compete with traffic on the interstate, it would slow them down. So we closed one lane of the interstate so trucks could pull onto the interstate, be in the right lane, all the way down to the area where they wanted to place. And then we created a temporary exit out of gravel and clay, cut a hole in the fence so trucks could drive off the interstate onto this exit and then onto the levee itself without ever stopping and then dump. And so we are dumping uh, more than one truckload a minute at, at our peak uh, construction period. So at one point, you used to be able to look on Google Earth, and it just happened that Google Earth photographs had taken some pictures of that area about the time we were building the levee. And so you could see the trucks lined up on the levee getting ready to dump their loads. Now that's been replaced by a more current picture, but it was, it was quite, a, quite an enterprise that both of those contractors uh, led and in both cases successfully. Both, in both cases though, we had times when uh, we were afraid the levees might fail. Uh, we called out the National Guard. We had the largest mobilization of the National Guard since the Rapid City flood of 1972. We had thousands of National Guard's uh, airmen and soldiers that were patrolling assigned portions of the levee and they patrolled them for 24 hours. So all night long and all day long, they walked back and forth on their half mile or their mile section, making sure the levee was, and we had one morning, I remember, where, uh, and they patrolled in pairs, where one pair said they heard a splash, they went over to the edge of the levee and they could see part of the levee had been undermined by flowing water, it had collapsed into the water, and the undermining was continuing. And uh, so they scrambled to call out the contractor. The contractor brought his equipment. And even as they were doing that, another fourth of that levy collapsed. And so we didn't know if we'd get the repair work done in time or if it would hold or if the contractor would be engulfed in water by a breach in the levy. And if that levy would have breached, then it would have just filled uh, a large section of Dakota Dunes and would have irreparably damaged many, many, many homes. But in the end, we, we were able to uh, rebuild that levee. We ended up then building huge rock ledges that extended from certain parts of the levee where underwater structures were creating a churning effect. And we put big quarry rock boulders to stop that churning and barricade against it to protect the levee uh, for the rest of the duration. And the levees really had to stand from the beginning of June all the way into August because it took that long to get all that water out of the system, even at those rates of 160,000 cubic feet per second at some points during the summer. I also learned the hydrology uh, is more complex than one would think. You can't, once you get the water 
to the point where you can reduce flows, you have to reduce it very slowly. The, the ground under the levees and part of the levees themselves have a much higher content of water. It doesn't cause them to decay, but they're full of water. And if you take away the subjacent support of the water and the weight of that water that's holding that levee from one side, you almost create a vacuum effect and pull the levee to breach. So we had to lower the water, not we, but the Corps of Engineers had to lower the water in stages very slowly so the levees wouldn't breach during that time. We also had uh, problems of uh, water infiltration behind the dams, or behind the levees, as that water on one side creates a lot of hydraulic pressure as it's held back by this huge levee. Here's this lowland over here. The water wants to find its way underneath, and groundwater was rising in all these homes, and so we had to get them to turn back the power, turn the power back on, even though uh, they were uncomfortable about it because they worried about uh, underground water and shorts and, and the safety of it. So we had to get our electrical inspectors down, inspect everything, and reassure them that they could turn the power on. And they had to do that so we could pump basements out all the time. And uh, so it was really quite a learning experience about hydrology and levee construction and uh, all those kinds of things. Can, can you give me an idea of perhaps what your concerns were as we moved through time and did they change? Sure. Uh, at first, uh, it was very difficult to be reassuring to the public as the message from the Corps of Engineers kept changing. We would tell them the flow was going to be at this rate, which translated into this elevation of water that would threaten their property. And so if you build sandbags up above that elevation, you're, you're protecting yourself. While everybody was working through the night, all day, all night, to build sandbag levees around their own homes, only for me to come out two days later and say, oh no, that elevation's not high enough, you need to keep working. Very frustrating to the public, and yet that was the only information we had, and, and the best information, and regrettably, it would have been nice to give them the worst news at the outset, but the news kept getting worse, so that, that was difficult. Also, I'd never called out the National Guard before. I was a new governor, I'd never had a disaster. You don't know how many people to call out, and they have to have missions. You just don't call out the National Guard and say, help where you think you should help. You have to have missions. Uh, the National Guard cannot go onto private property and help private citizens protect their assets. So their missions have to be more general public protection oriented. They can build sandbags or create sandbags, fill sandbags and, and make them available for private citizens to come and get. They can direct traffic, they can do those kinds of things. They can help protect evacuated areas so the property owners are are assured that, that looters or, or people with bad intent don't go in and rob them or burgle them. Uh, so we had to have assignments for them. And they ranged all over the place. They did do a lot of traffic management. They did do a lot of sandbag building. They built one of the levees here in the pier area, the levee that uh, is near the Ramcota, uh, the, uh, one of our horizontal units, we call it horizontal unit. Uh, built that levy themselves. So they, they did a lot of things. Um, there was also the need to keep the general public informed, not just those who were affected directly, but others who could help, and let them know in what ways they could help, and when and where they could help. So uh, we had regular press conferences every morning, um, giving out information. The mayors of the affected communities would hold forth in Pier and Fort Pier. It was those two mayors. Downstream it was you know, county officials and the um, director of Dakota Dunes and the Windstone and um, North Sioux City, McCook Lake. All those communities were threatened.
memory gets a little fuzzy after about day three, but I do distinctly remember a major general, a two-star general, promotable to three stars, a colonel promotable brigadier general, Governor Dugard, Lieutenant Governor Michaels, all standing in one spot in Fort Pierre. Yes. I've never seen anything like that in my life, and I could argue that I don't know that anyone ever has. It was unprecedented even in Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, it certainly was a very significant flood event, historic flood event. The people in Omaha realized that they probably uh, were being seen as not having called it soon enough. Uh, I think that's true. I think they could have called it a little earlier. I don't know whether they could have prevented it. Uh, the snowpack uh, held unusually long in the mountains. Uh, it normally should have started to melt sooner than it did. It should have stopped building sooner than it did. And then it was exacerbated by a huge rainfall event, five to seven inches in different parts of the upper watershed that was very widespread at the very time that the snowpack was uh, flowing heavily. And so the upstream governors, I remember getting a call from the governor of Montana saying, our rivers are roaring like I've never seen them before. And so if you're not hearing from the Army Corps, of course we were by then, if you're not hearing from the Army Corps that you are going to see some serious flooding, be aware. And of course that did occur. As you're going through this, you need to stay strong and you need to pull strength in order to keep going because you are the most visible representative of this event. How'd you do that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I didn't fully appreciate how my attitude and the uh, way I conveyed information would affect how uh, effectively we could respond. And I must say, one of the uh, people from FEMA who had seen disaster after disaster and probably worked with governor after governor, um, one of the very first press conferences said, now, uh, your people need to see your leadership here. They need to see decisiveness. They need to have uh, factual information they need to be reassured. And with that, they will feel empowerment and they will be more effective and be more responsive. And I realized that he was right. And so I spent a fair amount of time getting ready for those press conferences because that is the way a lot of people judged the performance of their government, the uh, opportunity for self reliance and for assisting their neighbors and how to do it and what ways would be the most effective. And so, and, and we, we had a pretty good methodology for conducting the press conferences. Generally, I would speak, our statewide emergency manager would speak, each of the mayors or other local government officials would speak, the Army Corps of Engineers would speak, and so everybody had their subject matter that they were concerned with. You know, the, the situation in Pier was different than the situation in Dakota Dunes or in North Sioux City. The water rose here first, and then a few days later, almost a week later, it arose downstream in, it peaked downstream in the North Sioux City, uh, Dakota Dunes area. So we had, we had to move more quickly in Pier and Fort Pier and yet we had a little bit of higher hill to climb because the levees were, uh, they were not parallel to the flow of the river as they are here in Fort Pier and Pier. The levees really were essentially containing the water, holding the water within the banks. Down at Dakota Dunes, in particular at the upstream side of Dakota Dunes, the water runs into Dakota Dunes and turns and then turns again. And so we knew that as this higher elevation crashed into the levees on the upstream side, it would be more threatening, more difficult to control. And um, those levees had to be especially well armored. Everyone did something. 
everyone pitched in somehow. And I understand uh, uh, you and the First Lady were no exception. A lot of us opened our homes to people who were displaced by the flood, and I'm told uh, you did that as well. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. We had, uh, of course, the governor's mansion is, is large, got many bedrooms, because you never know whether the governor and first lady are going to have kids at home, or, or as in Linda's, in my case, we have no kids at home. So we had five bedrooms uh, on the private side and then a couple of guest bedrooms. So we had a number of staff that were displaced in the office. And uh, we had another, uh, the manager of our, our uh, the mansion kitchen, her father had a lot of stuff that he had to get out and evacuate. So he said, well, just put it in the garage at the mansion. <laughs> and we had a couple people that became our house guests for a while. And we uh, filled up a couple stalls of the garage with some goods from this uh, retired man's home. And so, yeah, we tried to do our part. We had, on Memorial Day weekend, we had already planned for all our three adult children to come to Pier and their spouses. Uh, I don't think we had any grandchildren. We didn't have any grandchildren at that point. So all three kids and their respective spouses were going to get together and we were going to enjoy Memorial Day weekend in Pier. Well, as it turned out, of course, there, no one enjoyed Memorial Day weekend in Pier that summer. But the kids came anyway, and while I was at the Emergency Operations Center, you know, doing the planning and, and uh, working to coordinate things, uh, Linda and all the kids and their spouses all went and filled sandbags. And so we all tried to do our part, and I know so many people from around the state did, did help their neighbors help strangers. They really were spectacular. I'd like to think something good came out of this. What, what would that be in your eyes? I think the core of engineers learned how important it is to communicate as soon as possible and as frankly as possible about uh, the situation on the river. I think they would acknowledge that maybe they couldn't have prevented this. Now, some will disagree with them about that. The core believes they could not have prevented this because it was just an, a, a freak uh, spring. And I think that might be true. Uh, they definitely could have communicated sooner. And I think they acknowledge that. We also acknowledge that we have pretty good uh, monitoring systems for snowpack, for snowpack on the mountains in the upstream watershed. Not so good on the plains. And uh, so the, we've offered as a state to share in the cost of an expanded plains monitoring system, and really that hasn't happened. So we learned about what we could do, but we haven't done it yet, or at least the, uh, the federal government hasn't done it yet. I learned a lot about myself. I learned what a governor can do and must do and should do in response to a disaster. Always go to where it is, because if nothing else, people want to know that you know You've seen it, you're on the ground there, and you're experienced it, experiencing it with them, and then you'll do what you can. But if you're not there, they don't know if you even are aware of it. And if you're not aware of it, they don't have confidence that you're gonna help them. So that's one thing I learned. And, I, and I, it, lastly, it reinforced in my mind how proud I am to be governor of South Dakota with so many people responding to help their friends and neighbors and strangers that they don't even know uh, just came by the boatload and uh, helped uh, time and time again, day after day. Uh, it was just, it made me so proud to be a South Dakotan. All those National Guard troops are South Dakotans. All those contractors and their employees they're South Dakotans, all those volunteers that got nothing except the feeling that they were helping their fellow South Dakotans. They came from everywhere, from all corners of the state, and even from out of state. We had many volunteers from out of state come to South Dakota to help us. Um, it really uh, reinforced in my mind um, the, good, the goodness in people and how if 
they see their fellow human beings in trouble and they can help. South Dakotans don't go by. They are the Good Samaritans that stop and help their fellow citizens. And I, I've said it this way before, as high as the water rose, South Dakotans rose higher.